The clock is ticking, and Bruce Willis is on a mission to save the world from a giant asteroid in Armageddon. One of the movies we'll be reviewing this week on Cisco and Ebert, and we'll take a look at the newly restored version of Gone with the Wind. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Armageddon is appropriately named because while you're seeing it, you will feel as though you've been in combat, visual combat and oral combat. This could have been the movie that was shown to Malcolm McDowell in A Clockwork Orange to make him sick of violence. <laughs> Am I communicating? We're talking non-stop action and noise. That doesn't make it a bad movie. Rather, the audacity of the way it has been put together eventually becomes almost amusing. The situation is this. An asteroid the size of Texas is hurtling toward Earth. Deep Corps oil driller Bruce Willis is called upon by NASA Chief Billy Bob Thornton to help save the world. We're a little short on time here. Will you help us? All they gotta do is drill. That's it. No spacewalking, no crazy astronaut stuff. Just drill. So Willis recruits his own men, including Ben Affleck and Steve Buscemi. Their mission, land two space shuttles on the big rock, drill holes for nuclear bombs, and blow the sucker off its trajectory. The United States government just asked us to save the world. Anybody want to say no? Regarding the human element in the film, as little as there is, I was struck by the impact of young actress Liv Tyler as Willis's daughter and Ben Affleck's girlfriend. Do you think it's possible that anyone else in the world is doing this very same thing at this very same moment? I hope so. Otherwise, what the hell are we trying to say? Now, each element of their plan serves as its own action film, and director Michael Bay, whose last picture was The Rock, which also was strikingly noisy, dares us to relax in Armageddon. Armageddon is blaringly intense. By the end, I didn't care whether Earth was saved as much as I wanted to survive myself. But again, if you get into this mood with this picture, I was laughing. That's a strangely entertaining and amusing experience. If you can stop blinking and, of course, take your fingers out of your ears. So a weird, truly weird thumbs up from me. Well, we saw the same picture, but my thumb is way down. I wanted to escape from this movie. I didn't I care if the asteroid hit, hit the Earth or not. I was afraid the movie was going to hit me. And, you know, yeah, it it's you. cut so quickly Absolutely. that there's no uh, a stretch of action that makes any sense or is comprehensible in any way. This movie, the entire movie, is cut together like a coming attractions trailer. Yeah, no question. And it was bewildering. Or, or, or the TV it, ad for the film. It was aggressive, and it was assaulting, and it was too noisy. And I like The Rock. I gave The Rock thumbs oh, up. Okay. But this film, to me, doesn't have any kind of an arc or any kind of dramatic interest. And when it stops for drama, like when they're all saying goodbye to oh, each yeah, other, yeah. before you know, like seconds are ticking down. If they don't get that bomb ready in another... 20 seconds, the earth ends, and they're saying goodbye to each other on television. Let, I couldn't understand that. Let me give people one piece of advice. If you go to a multiplex and it has Armageddon in it, do not go to a movie next door. Because oh, there will be two down. There will be tremendous audio yeah. bleed. But it's, it's assaulting. Yeah. Yeah. It really well, I, it, it was too much for me. I, I just felt that it was... Uh, but I was smiling. Overkill. Okay. okay. A strange split vote on Armageddon. The film Sound and Fury eventually won me over in a laughing way, but Roger disliked it for exactly the same reason. Our next movie is number six in the seemingly endless series of Police Academy movies. This one, number six, subtitled City Under Siege. And you know, it's never too late to learn on this job, Gene. If we thought the first Police Academy movie was kind of dumb, we hadn't seen anything yet. I thought it was very dumb. Very dumb. Steve Gutenberg has retired from the series, but most of the other regulars are back, including G.W. Bailey as Captain Harris, who's constantly the butt of practical jokes. Excuse me. Captain Harris, the mayor wants to see you as soon as possible. The mayor would like to see me. <laughs> well, don't keep him waiting. <laughs> On the trail of bad guys, Michael Winslow does a robot imitation. What the hell are you made of? 
Bruce Mailer is the hapless officer factor who can't even look at something without breaking it. Hi! Oh, no. burn! Uh, Hi, Tower! Oh, hello. Uh, How do you... Uh, whoops! <laughs> I went to see Police Academy 6 on a Saturday matinee with a lot of little kids in the audience, and about halfway through the movie, I began to feel a certain nostalgia. I realized I was remembering the Saturday afternoons when I was a kid, and I used to go to the Bowery Boys or Abbott and Costello movies. The Police Academy movies are sort of in the same tradition, dumb, but cheerfully dumb, with a lot of goofy slapstick and silly sight gags. They're aimed at a young audience, they're made for a young audience, in their own way they succeed, and creating dim-witted comedy in the Bowery Boys tradition. It's just that I'm not one of those little kids anymore. This movie is not made to be seen by or maybe even to be reviewed by adults. Well, I can only tell you, uh, I won't review the audience except to say that uh, I saw it late night and there were adults in the theater. Uh, looking at the picture, I was astonished as I have been throughout the series at just how stupid the films are. Um, I don't think they're as good as Abbott and Costello, but I, I, I just... No, no, no. I, I, I just don't laugh. I, I, I think they're kind of cheap. Um, I think that they hold shots that are hold them far too long where they should be, I suppose, maybe they're waiting for a laugh. I don't find it myself filling them with laughs. Uh, this movie came out, the first one came out the same time as The Right Stuff. I thought The Right Stuff was going to be a smash hit, and uh, I've always associated the Police Academy series with The Right Stuff. They came out at the, roughly the same time. This one went to the moon. Right Stuff didn't. Yeah. And uh, well, I was I, just I, trying to, I'm just trying to categorize this movie, kind of a generic approach to film criticism. Sure, none of them are as good as Abbott and Costello, but they're kind of on the level of the Bowery Boys. And one footnote that we have to put in here. On this show, we have constantly over the years referred to the fruit cart scene, the obligatory scene in a chase where the car races onto the sidewalk and knocks over a fruit stand and races away, and the fruit vendor is shaking his head at the departing car. In this scene, there is a tribute to our criticism. There's Gene and Roger's fruit stand and the big, uh, enormous, big, big foot truck with the 20 foot wheels does not run over it. And for that, I suppose, I suppose we're supposed to be grateful, but you know, I'm not really that grateful. I don't know how you feel, but. I wasn't grateful. Um, I mean, it was amusing, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's about the only smile I had in the whole film. Tango and Cash, a lethal weapon wannabe about two cop that is ultimately an exhausting, unhappy entertainment thanks to a hyper-violent story that has feuding cop partners Sylvester Sloan and Kurt Russell emptying a virtual munitions factory firepower into a gang of drug-dealing mobsters led by Jack Palance. And the boys, and these truly are boys, meet cute as they are both sent from competing police districts in Los Angeles to the same drug deal. They know of each other's drug-busting reputations. You're the second best cop in LA. That's funny, I hear the same thing about you. The drug dealers soon arrange through crooked cops to frame both Tango and Cash, and that forces the boys to bicker even more. My lawyer wants me to cop a plea. Yeah, mine too. 18 months, Lompoc Federal Country Club. I think you'll love it. I understand they open the gym at 5 a.m. You can start pumping early. Predictably, the movie ends with its biggest display of firepower as the boys are outfitted with a souped-up RV in which they attack the gangster's headquarters. Go! Real subtle! We're in! You've seen that before, and the noise and the explosions and the constant gunplay are truly tiresome. Having seen both Lethal Weapon films recently, these jokes seem lame, and the rivalry of the boys seems fraudulent. Both Stallone and Russell are essentially playing the same want-to-be-like character, only their clothes are different. For all of the action, Tango and Cash is a boring film, and that's important because in Lethal Weapon pictures, they were oh, two different characters. See, it's not that I don't like movies about two cops and lots of special effects, it's just that I don't like bad movies about two cops and lots of special effects, and Tango and Cash is a waste of valuable electricity. I mean, I think they should have just not made this movie. There is nothing there that is worth anybody's time to see. It's a no-brainer movie. It doesn't even make the slightest difference when you walk in. You can start right, this movie true. at any time. If you happen to have it at home on videotape, you know, you can just start it at random and then rewind it and come in from the beginning. It's a loop. It's a loop of very few wisecracks, lots of explosions, lots of guns, Jack Palance playing with his mice, which is supposed to make him into some kind of a character, plus right. his obsolete TV screen. 
things that were out about 10 years there's, ago that he's so you know, proud of. There's no, I mean, I reviewed it. You just dismissed it. Let's yeah. uh, get on Let's to the next. Let's move on. Yeah. Right. Next, coming up next. Golden, The Lord of the Rings, one of six holiday movies we'll review this week. I'm Roger Ebert. And I'm Richard Roper. The Fellowship of the Ring, the first installment of the J.R.R. Tolkien trilogy, is an epic in every sense. A marvelous looking movie with jaw-dropping sets and impressive special effects. But it repeats itself too often and drones on for nearly three hours. The brooding Elijah Wood of The Ice Storm and the husky Sean Astin from Rudy are curious choices to play Frodo and Samwise, who must destroy the ring that is the source of all evil in a land called Middle-earth. It's some form of elvish. I can't read it. And there are a few who can. The language is that of Mordor, which I will not utter here. That's Ian McKellen as Gandalf the Grey, the good-hearted wizard who guides Frodo through his perilous quest. Viggo Mortensen is Aragorn, a.k.a. Strider. Are you frightened? Yes. Not nearly frightened enough. I know what hunts you. Frodo and his band of hobbits are relentlessly pursued by the Dark Ring Wraiths. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings books have enchanted tens of millions of readers, but as a movie, The Fellowship of the Ring gets bogged down under the weight of all those mystical speeches and self-consciously quirky characters. You've got nine members of The Fellowship, dueling wizards, you've got an elf princess played by Liv Tyler, an elf queen played by Kate Blanchett, just too many characters for me to care about. On and on it goes only to reach an abrupt non-ending straight out of a Saturday afternoon serial. So you're giving it a thumbs down? I'm giving it a thumbs down. Oh, uh, well, I like it. Uh, I think that it indicates a return by Hollywood to the kind of curries that led to great epics like uh, Lawrence of Arabia and uh, the Star Wars trilogy. Uh, uh, a, a really out there kind of large-scale, ambitious undertaking well, that is too long. I agree with you. It's okay. too long, except for the people who are going to go see it. And they won't find it to be too long. Oddly enough, well, the you know people, what? Frodo the Hobbit ain't the people, Lawrence of Arabia, first people, of all. Okay? The people who have your objections to this film are not the kinds of people that will ever go to see it in the first place. The characters are getting tedious after a while. They go on one adventure this after another. Lord and, of this, the Rings. and this I mean, Frodo the know. Hobbit character who is in this little, you know, elfin world or whatever, and he goes from one place to another, and he's wide eyed, and he's wide eyed. You think after the 15th beast or the 14th elf or the little sprite that he wouldn't well, be so okay. Okay. amazed by Middle Earth. It's I obviously this magical be. land, and they're all going after this silly little ring that makes people go, ooh, yeah. evil Okay, stuff. okay. I, mean, I would not story. be completely honest if I didn't say that I can understand where you're coming from. On the other hand, if you're going to start talking about the Lord of the Rings on the grounds that they're going after this silly little ring, yeah. then I think you're kind of missing the whole point of the book. And the ring is what sets the so entire plot of the motion. That's right, characters. that's right. I thought it was a visually powerful epic, and I enjoyed it. But i got to say my enjoyment was tempered by a little sadness that the innocence or naivete of the original books has kind of been lost in the middle of a high-tech special effects adventure picture. One thing that bothers me is that the hobbits are the heroes of the books, but in the movie, the tall people, the men, the wizards, and the elves, take the initiative and give the orders. Oh, man. Give the ring to Frodo. So my thumb is up for The Lord of the Rings. It's an impressive achievement, but I am a little melancholy that the movie is a violent action picture, and the books by Tolkien come from a kinder and gentler time. But Richard... At a time when Hollywood has such small visions, the, the purity, the ambition, the scope, the vastness of this film, those guards protecting the way down that river passage. I agree. All of that is all impressive. Well hey, they spent a ton of money on this movie, and you can see the money on the screen. Yeah. It looks great, and the little people don't look like they're superimposed against the regular size people, and the giants look like giants, and all that good stuff. But, Roger, it goes on forever. Okay, well, I'm and then, say... And I understand that movies, you know, Harry Potter is part of a series, but it ends on a satisfactory note. Okay. This thing, it's like after three hours, and they kind of look at each other, and they almost look at the, at the, at okay. the, at the viewers and go, okay, well, see you next you. Christmas for another big commercial well, movie. Well, of course, because it is... It's a trilogy. It is a trilogy, so it doesn't end after the first book. It's, it's going to be a twenty-seven dollar trilogy for okay, people, though. Okay. I think for nine bucks you well, should get I some feel, kind of closure. Well, I do feel for myself that Harry Potter is a better movie. Absolutely. Again, I Without do know question. that there are some people who are not true believers who are going to say what you said about Fellowship of the Ring. But I believe oh. in the quest. All right, fine. Okay. okay, I sat down and I had a long talk with myself after I saw our next movie, which is named Child's Play 2. And I found myself having an argument between my head and my heart. 
My head told me that this movie did indeed deliver the goods, that it was a truly frightening thriller and it was a well-made film. But my heart told me the movie was sick and unwholesome, a completely malignant exercise. The movie once again tells the story of a little boy who is terrorized by an evil doll, a doll named Chucky, that contains the mind and soul of a mass murderer. The violent and malicious doll was destroyed at the end of the first movie, but now Chucky is back. I told you. We were going to be friends to the end. And now it's time to play. This is a movie in which a little boy's mother is taken away from him and he lives with foster parents and is blamed for the death of one of them. And everywhere he goes, people are killed and mutilated and nobody will believe him. And this Chucky doll is pure evil, unadulterated, profane, and foul-mouthed evil. The closing sequence of Child's Play 2 inside a toy factory is truly horrifying. It's good filmmaking, but it made me feel unclean and disturbed as I was watching it. And I can only imagine what effect it might have on small children. As a film critic, I have to say this movie is well made and effective, but as a human being, I wish I hadn't seen it. What good can come of having such foul and ugly images pumped into your mind? I think that my uh, heart and mind may be closer connected than yours. I, I don't make too much of a distinction. Um, I, I thought that uh, I was laughing at the film because it was so preposterous um, when they have that little doll uh, attacking with a knife. At the same time, it's sickening. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't think that the filmmaking was pretty good. I, I'll, the only thing I'll grant you is the the, the, the final fight in the in the toy factory the toy is factory. well staged yes, because you have all the boxes and that's and that's and the pretty assembly engaged. line and all that's the other I, stuff. Okay, yes. that, that part. But that's the that's the end of the picture. Uh, all of the other setup involving the doll is, is, is really silly. And again, I must well, stress and I must stress how violently abusive the doll is and how uh, sickening the, the, the role that the, an actual child yeah, had to see, play opposite. Even then you're contradicting yourself because if it's silly then it wouldn't be violently abusive. It's more than silly, Gene. Oh, no. It's really sick. The, I have a knee-jerk response to showing children in jeopardy and it is, it is cheap and is rarely justified and in this piece of trash it's not justified Well, my at only all. point would be that the movie is even worse because it's so well made. You have to grant it it's well made and that's only, one only of the in the I'll last sequence. Jack, did I tell you they tore down the old lighthouse? Oh, no, the, the one in the point? Yeah. Oh, I love that old place. Yeah, so did we. Macaulay Culkin plays a bad boy, a very bad boy in The yes. Good Son, one of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert, along with the first directing jobs by celebrated actors Robert De Niro and Morgan Freeman, and also a study of teenagers growing up way back in the mid 19 70s. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first movie is named The Good Son, and it's a movie that inspires an obvious question, which is, why in the world was this movie made? What possible audience is there for a film starring Macaulay Culkin as a sadistic and hateful little monster and murderer? Maybe somebody somewhere thinks of this as entertainment, but I think of it as an exercise in irresponsibility by everyone connected to the project, especially the young boy's parents and managers who should have thought twice before exposing him to such a distasteful role. The movie stars Elijah Wood as a little boy whose mother dies and his father has to leave the country on business, so he's sent to live for a couple of weeks with the family of his cousin, played by Macaulay Culkin. Life on their main island is one life-threatening situation after another. I let you go. You think you could fly? This little kid is full of tricks. Here they're almost savaged by a killer dog. And in a later scene, Culkin will actually kill that dog before his cousin's eyes. And what about this scene? Culkin has just dropped a human dummy on the highway, causing a multiple car traffic pileup. Do you know what you did? Hey, come on. We did it together. You could have killed people your help. Eventually, his mother figures out her son is not so good and may have been responsible for drowning his baby brother in a bathtub. Where'd you get that? You know where I got it. I couldn't find it after Richard's accident. Have you had it all this time? It was mine before it was his. And, of course, if Mama's going to make all kinds of trouble and be a bad sport, he knows how to take care of her, too. 
The Good Son is a reprehensible film trading on little children in order to create sick images with no redeeming value except, I guess, to entertain, although I cannot imagine anyone being entertained by this movie. What really disturbed me were the scenes of small children in danger and the scenes in which this young man, Macaulay Culkin, is required to act out the murders of his family members, innocent bystanders, and even a dog. Macaulay Culkin has a lot of young fans, and all I can say is the movie, which is rated R, is completely inappropriate for children. And two of the children who should have been kept out of it are Macaulay Culkin and Elijah Wood. You know, they're both pretty good actors. Yes, and they it is, are. It is awful, an awful film for all the reasons that you mentioned. And then it's stupid also on its own level. For example, the dummy is thrown off, the, uh, Macaulay Culkin throws the dummy off in, in a highway, the cars crack up. Never again is it mentioned in the investigation about the dummy. Did you notice that? Yeah. There was, uh -huh. That's not pursued. And the two kids are in full view yes. of anybody on the highway. In other words, it yeah. doesn't have, as stupid and as offensive as the film is, it doesn't even have a logic within its own That's sordid right. details. Right. Uh, the ending of the film is similarly awful, where the character questions the mother's uh, mental state, when yeah. it makes absolutely no sense whatever. Even the last line of the film is yeah. a fraud. It's yeah. a terrible film yeah. from beginning to end, and I hope you're right. I hope that kids are prevented from seeing this picture. You know, they, parents may not be smart enough. A lot of kids know that Macaulay Culkin a new is in movie. it, and they loved his other movies, yes. and I've already gotten letters from parents saying, is this okay for my 9-year-old or my 11-year-old? The answer is no. It's not okay for anyone. can't keep a good man down, especially Rocky Balboa. He's up and at him again fighting a Russian champion in Rocky IV. One of four new movies we'll be reviewing this week on At the Movies, the movie review program. I'm Gene Sisko, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun Times. As most everyone knows by now, in Rocky IV, Rocky Balboa, the working man hero, fights the machine-like Russian champion named Ivan Drago. How tough is Drago? This tough. Now shall we have a demonstration? Please do. A normal heavyweight averages 700 pounds of pressure per square inch. Drago averages 1,850 pounds. But that's making the result quite obvious. And what results are those? Whatever he hits, he destroys. But before Rocky fights Drago, Apollo Creed, the ex-champ, decides he wants to win back his self-respect by taking on Drago himself, which is spec is a dumb move. Can I uh, ask you something? So you want to respect your head against the rest of you think maybe they're aiming against him? If it's not him, then he moves it again. <laughs> but you think maybe it's like uh, you against you? you think? No, I think you really are getting brain damage. That's what I think, Stan. Well, maybe, but uh, it really, I'm speaking the truth here, pal. Are you? Yeah. I don't think I want to hear this, Stan. Oh, come on. Hey, Paul, look. You were a great fighter, no doubt about that. But look, we got to face the facts, too. You don't want to believe it, but maybe the show is over. And that's easy for you to say you're still on top. Of course, Drago beats Apollo. If Drago lost, think about it. He'd be back in Russia and the whole movie would be over. And instead, he creams Apollo, and early on in their fight, he's whipping Rocky. Um, what's happening out there? He's winning. I see three of them out there. Get the one in the middle. Right. Get the one in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Now, this may surprise you, but I really like Rocky IV a lot. That I, does surprise me. <laughs> I'm amazed. Well, well, then I'm going to be amazed at you. Let me explain why. Okay. I knew what was going to happen in this picture. I mean, everyone knows what's going to happen in this picture, yet I got caught up in both of its fights. 
I even got a little bit caught up. I, this is almost embarrassing to admit. In the 15th round of that fight, I thought somebody's going to play a trick on me. I got caught up in it. I enjoyed Rocky's brief moments with his wife and his son, which I had wanted in Rocky III and didn't get enough of. In fact, my only complaint is that there weren't enough of those scenes in this Rocky IV. The original Rocky worked because of its love story, I think, as well as its boxing. And Stallone, the writer and director, has de-emphasized the love angle throughout all of the series and to their detriment. But what he does know how to do, and this is what makes this film work, is create a great, colorful villain. First, the brash Apollo Creed in number one. Then Rocky II, my favorite, the villain was really Rocky himself, his overblown ego. Then in Rocky III, that mad dog, Clubber Lang, played by Mr. T. Now, even Drago, well played by the adonis like Dolph Lundgren. He's a great villain, and we sit back there and enjoy the film. It's a great hour and a half to eat popcorn by, and I want more, because he can make another great villain. I want Rocky V. I don't want Rocky V. Please don't give me Rocky V. I thought oh, you'd rather have Halloween V. I wouldn't rather have Halloween V, and I don't want Friday the 13th V. Okay. What I'm amazed about is that you wanted Rocky IV. This yeah. movie is the bottom of the barrel. There, every, at the beginning, the first half hour, every scene is yeah. obligatory. He has to check in with Adrian. He has to talk to his brother-in-law. Here's little Rocky Jr. What would you have him Here's do? Meet a whole bunch of new people? Well, I think that would be interesting. Yes, as a matter of fact. <laughs> he had a great idea in 1976. He made yeah. a great movie based yes, on that did. idea about a real human being named yeah. Rocky Balboa and a touching love affair with this girl. Now yes, Balboa has turned into this egotistical monster who takes over the entire movie. The other little people in his life have their run on. Then there's the fight at, at, at the two-third, at the one-third mark where somebody loses, yeah. and the fight is the two-third mark. Okay, you haven't told me this anything. This movie is absolutely absolutely formula, yeah. it is predictable, no. it is uninspired, and it is not exciting, no. and even the fight no. at the end, which no. usually works for me, didn't work this time. <laughs> Roger, you like some of the others in the series, too, so they've been yeah, formulated. As a matter of fact, I they have been, yeah. and you yeah. knew exactly what's yeah. going to happen then. That's right. Yeah. And I'm mm -hmm. telling you that this time, this villain, we've complained about Clint Eastwood not coming up with great villains. We've complained with this, the, the James Bond series not coming up with great villains. It's a common flaw. Let me ask you, you yeah, tell me, is even Drago a good villain or a bad villain? Let me ask uh, no, answer that one first. Uh, as he's a moderately interesting villain, but let me ask you an Thank even you. better question. Thank you. How come he never has a single scene along with his wife? The woman know. who does all of it speaking for him. I did how, me. Come, how come she's such a big character and has nine times more dialogue than he has? Because he's supposed to be stolid and a tough Russian. He, maybe, he maybe, punched, she talks. Maybe it's because <laughs> she's played by Stallone's uh, girlfriend. I think no, she did I a think nice so. job. Because I think if he'd been allowed to take yeah. over all of that dialogue and uh, be more of a character, it would have been a lot better than him sitting there silently right. while Bridget Nielsen has no. all of the best lines. I don't think so. Uh, you don't I think, think so? Said, well, no, I do no. think so. As I said, he punched, she talked. Coming up next to the movie, we love fears that are adopted. I love it in the kitchen, baby. You know that. Richard Dreyfus and Holly Hunter are lovers separated by dangerous work and then by life itself in Steven Spielberg's Always. Always makes the kind of grand emotional gesture that Steven Spielberg likes in his films and is filled with the sensational special effects that he's famous for. But somehow, they don't add up to much. The whole movie feels like a story gimmick without much heart. And the special effects are possibly even overdone this time. There are scenes here where the planes are plowing through blazing treetops like a lawnmower, and it's so unlikely that they don't crash right in and there that the whole movie loses credibility. Another problem, the movie's dialogue seems dated and artificial, especially when Dreyfus comes back from the dead and starts giving his advice to the living. The bad news is this is one of Spielberg's weakest movies since his comedy, 1941. It is a weak film, and I think uh, I want to focus on the dialogue mm -hmm. trouble that you talked about. What annoyed me about the film, the first two-thirds of the film, is that Richard Dreyfus, with his whiny, nasal voice, and Holly Hunter, with her whiny, nasal voice, which can be very good in sort of a contemporary story, and maybe when they're apart from each other, mm -hmm. but when those two are going at it in what is going to be sentimental kind of film, it doesn't fit at all. Mm -hmm. And I saw all of them just trading wisecracks for the longest time. Very artificial stuff. When I know, and you can tell that this movie is going to move to an emotional conclusion. The conclusion is kind of sweet. There's a final statement said by Dreyfus about love withheld is love that you're going to regret withholding all your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So deliver it now. Another problem in this movie, the original film was about people giving their lives in war mm -hmm. for our country mm -hmm. in World War II, a war we wanted to win, a war we believed in. Now they're fighting fires. Now it's important to fight forest fires. But it's not, I, I, I just don't think it's important enough to sacrifice your life to fight a forest fire. And that's what these people, well, not, not only does he do it, 
But every day they go out okay, there as if they could do it, so okay. that it takes it takes the realistic. Uh, under, what are you, no, what no, are I think going like this for? because I think you're going to be misunderstood. Oh God, I wouldn't want that to happen. Okay, no, okay, no. I think that the forest fires, however important that is, it's important. Okay, but yeah, but this is done in such an artificial way. This isn't really forest fire. This is no, using the no. fire as a stunt. The, the setting yeah. uses uh -huh. it as a stunt for this kind of emotion. The forest, the actual forest fighting, uh, firefighting is uh, <laughs> forest fighting. Uh, firefighting, that's a worthwhile task. Yes, but Don't it's not enough. worth sacrificing your life for. It's mm -hmm. not like World War II. Uh, and I, that's why the basic motivation is missing. I think it's the way it's photographed as a stunt rather than a real activity. Okay, well, I'm okay. glad you kept anyone from misunderstanding me, and now that they understood you, we're way ahead. Okay.